now recording. So we are now live and recording. And uh, I'll just, for the moment, turn it over to Larry, Larry Dillenbeck, my colleague. Uh, Larry and I have had these ongoing uh, connection since the mid 90s. And one of our uh, activities is we do creative collaborations together and this kind of event has evolved out of those conversations. We've done several little web events along the way. So Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you as the uh, uh, interviewer host here in a way. Yes, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you, Nick, and uh, exploring all of the common interests that we have. Um, Nick and I, as Nick mentioned, we go way back to the early 90s. We're both um, uh, practitioners and trainers in uh, hypnotherapy and neurolinguistic programming and coaching and a host of other things that, uh, that we're interested in. And so, um, I've been a, a big fan of Nick's work for uh, ever since we met. And one of the things that I really appreciated about you, Nick, when we first met was your, your mastery of language and um, not only in terms of like precision, but also artistry. And, uh, and of course, your, uh, the way you use poetry along with many of these other modalities to create transformational poetry. And so, uh, if you wouldn't mind just um, giving us a little taste of your, your background and what led you to, um, what inspired you to write the book? Yeah. For some reason right now, I'm reminded that when I was 13 years old, I wrote a novel. It was a spy novel, because I was very much into spies at the time. I wrote this spy novel, handwritten, 50 pages, um, front and back, 50 pages, and... Uh, <clears throat> And I remember at the time having this fantasy or this idea that I could actually be a writer. Um, but like happens often with those childhood dreams, that wasn't supported. My parents certainly weren't supportive of it. Uh, I didn't get the cue or the, the indication from the world that I could succeed as a writer. So I kind of put that on the back burner. I wrote poetry when I was young and uh, was in a class where we had to submit a poem as one of our assignments. And the teacher, you know, I like worked, worked this poem for two weeks as best I could and really thought it was a great poem and submitted. I was really proud of that work. And I got back, it was a C minus. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, probably poetry is not my thing. And I think this often happens to us in life. We have some talent or some passion or some interest when we're young. Maybe it's a musical instrument we play, or maybe it's some piece of the kind of artwork we do, or maybe it's dance or singing or something, but it's not reinforced by the world enough for our little egos to hold on to that. And oftentimes we bury that passion. Now, I don't think the burying of the passion is actually bad, because in my case, I was pretty sensitive. And I think the criticism of the world, if I had tried to pursue writing, might have actually killed my flame, so to speak. Um, but since I didn't pursue it at the time, it kind of went under the surface. And then over the years, in uh, you could say the, you know, from my mid-20s all the way up till my late 40s, I, I really didn't write much poetry. Occasionally I would, but not commonly. And then uh, somewhere around 19, late, maybe mid-90s or late 90s, I started writing poetry again. And then 2000, really in a committed way. So I think there was this proclivity for writing poetry that was always there under the surface, that was waiting for a moment to be ignited again. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about being a human is that something can go under the surface that's incomplete and is forming its own life in a way. And when we come back to it later on, it has a new expression that can be embraced in a new way. And I really think that's true for me in poetry. And I didn't start writing poetry by studying poetry or by going to poetry classes. I started writing poetry as a way of expressing the transformations that I was going through and other people were going through. That's why I call myself the transformational poet. So that's a little uh, background there about how poetry came about. I studied for years, as, as Larry was saying, I studied hypnotherapy and uh, neurolinguistic programming, and both of them involved the effective use of language. And I fell in love with the work of Milton Erickson. Many of you know who he is. 
who had this incredible, powerful use of language to be able to say just a few words sometimes and people would make these interesting realizations or conclusions and, and dramatic changes sometimes in their lives. And that fascinated me, that words could have that power. And so I, I became curious about how to use words in ways that could really touch hearts and transform lives. And that's what I believe poetry ultimately does, touches hearts and transforms lives. So hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> yes, very much so, thank you. <laughs> yes, and that's, um, you know, so um, I think this is, this is your eighth book, um, The Undiscovered Country, Living in Your Own Heartland. And um, I, luckily I have all of your books and I've read m most of them. I think I might be partway through a couple of them, including this one. And, and I've enjoyed them all very much. Um, and this one it, it intrigues me a lot because you, you have a really unique structure with this particular book. Um, and so in a moment, I'll ask you a little bit more to talk about the, the archetypal journey and the four quadrants. Um, so, and this, this particular meeting this morning is the second of four. Um, so last week we talked about the first quadrant, which was um, uh, the known inner world and how, how we connect with ourselves. And so today we're gonna explore the second quadrant uh, of the archetypal journey. But if you would just um, tell us a little bit about the, how you structured the book in terms of the poetry and prose and the, um, the tasks and questions and things, the archetypal map. Yeah. You know, a lot of questions there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know when I was, when the idea came to my mind of this intersecting axis, so there's the outer world, the inner world, the known and the unknown that makes four quadrants. When that idea came to mind, I immediately got this sense that that expressed, that you could say each quadrant expressed a, a question or core issue that we as humans have to address at some point in our lives. So, you know, you have the outer world, the inner world, the known or conscious and the unknown or unconscious, and that creates four quadrants. So there's the known inner world, which would be yourself, your relationship to yourself. And um, for me, there's a poetic and a philosophic question for each of the sections. So the poetic question is, who are you? And I think that's a perennial question we have to answer throughout our lives because we're fluid beings. We're, there's no one definition that, that holds a person for their whole life. And if there is, then they actually aren't a growing, evolving being. So the question, who are you? We revisit that we actually change our sense of ourselves in different contexts. So there's that perennial question of who are you? And for me, the poetic question is how wide is your embrace of yourself in your life? How able are you to sort of embrace or embody the full expression of yourself, both the things that might seem uh, dark to you, which would be the challenges and difficulties, and the things that might seem uh, wonderful about you? Sometimes we deny those as much as we deny the more, quote, negative parts or shadow figures, as Jung would call them. So that's the philosophical question, the poetic question. And then it occurred to me that each one of them kind of involves some tasks that we are, again, are engaged with in our life that we work through at one point and then we revisit them again later on and later on. So uh, um, that first one, you know, had the tasks of uh, embracing sort of the, the shadow, uh, living the full catastrophe, which is a line from uh, the book Zorba the Greek, Greek uh, by Niklas uh, Kazan, Kazantzakas. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, anyway, uh, he, he talks about living the full catastrophe and actually a uh, mindfulness uh, teacher, John Kabat-Zinn, used that as the title of his book, which is kind of about our life is going to get messy. Our life is going to get crazy, we're gonna make mistakes, but how do we walk through that with dignity and live our best lives despite that? So there's those in them welcoming the hero home. So that's what we did last time. This time we're going into the unknown inner world, which to me is the philosophical question of what is your source? What is your source in life? And it's about being embedded in a deeper, grander, mystery than ourselves. So I think we are a mystery. We don't really know ourselves, but then there's the greater mystery of life. So the uh, uh, 
philosophical question is, what is your source or where do you come from? And the poetic question is, how deep is your taproot of trust in life? So the first part, known self, is about embracing yourself. This part is really about deepening your trust in life. Um, and then we'll be going on to the, the, third and, the third and fourth, the other two quadrants in the next two weeks, which uh, would be the known outer world and the unknown outer world. And I can go into more of those next time around. But uh, I think of these as archetypal. I, the word archetype actually just means like model or pattern. And it was used in uh, Greek originally as the first model or first pattern of something, sort of the primal pattern or primal model. And I think of this as an archetypal map because these are primal questions that we can return to. If I answer who I am at one point in life and come up with a sense of that or have a sense of myself, that's going to be different when I come to a different point in my life. And also, I, I like the idea of the quadrants because as we explore one quadrant, we find that we have to work in other quadrants to support that. So for me to expand my embrace of myself, I may need to deepen my trust in life to do that. So these sometimes will interact as well. Nice. Yeah, I, you know, this, this new section, the unknown inner world, um, one of the things that really touched me up or that resonated for me in that section was you make the distinctions between shallow, shallow roots and deep roots and also shallow truths and deep truths. And, and I really love those distinctions. And, and I've been, uh, you know, contemplating what that means to me, particularly in terms of the uh, deep versus shallow roots. Uh, would you talk more with us about those distinctions? Yeah, the, you know, I, I think of roots as those things that nourish us as a human being, that nourish our soul, that feed our spirit. And, you know, it occurred to me one day that when you think of food, which we use to nourish our body, there is some food that's, that tastes good but isn't nourishing and actually might even be healthy for us. And there's some food that's really nourishing or there's some things we definitely need. We certainly need water and we need some very basic things. Um, and so I, I started thinking about roots similarly. We can have things that we, that, that nourish us, but aren't really healthy for us. So like watching TV, it might nourish something like we need to take a break, but a lot of TV probably isn't that healthy <laughs> for our soul and our spirit. You know, like watching the constant repeat repetition on the news of the same negative event, filming it over and over and over again. I mean, how many times do we need to see that? <laughs> and so for me, there's that, you know, there's this, this degree of, of how much something actually nourishes our soul and our spirit and how much we actually connect with it. So deep roots are those things that nourish us very deeply and we also get nourishment from them fairly regularly or often. Like I write every day. So I have deep roots in writing and I find that process of writing deeply nourishing to my spirit and my soul. Some of you may have a conversation. You may talk to some person every single day of your life. And there's something in that right relationship. Ideally, there's something in that relationship that's deeply nourishing between the two of you. Um, and then there's the shallow, shallow roots. You might, you might not have them often in your life, but they can be very nourishing. So shallow means that you just haven't have, you don't have that kind of consistency with them, but they also can be nourishing. So to me, it's two questions. To what degree is the thing that's nourishing us actually nourishing us? And to what degree does it play, or what role does it play in our life in terms of frequency of support we get from it? Nice. Would there, um, maybe uh, this would be a good point to maybe share uh, one of the poems from that section that, uh, uh, they're, I mean, they're all magnificent, but uh, just to give us a taste. Well, each of the sections also starts out with a primary poem. And so um, the primary poem for this section is one that I wrote, I think it was around 2002, called Sacred Relics. And um, I wrote it after reading a, a book by Philip Cosineau called The Art of Pilgrimage. And he was talking about how if we hold our lives as a pilgrimage, as a journey, um, if we took our days that way, then we could live a richer, more meaningful, more beautiful life. And pilgrimage is what people do to honor a spiritual tradition or to go to a sacred site. 
And when they take on a pilgrimage, they typically walk with greater reverence. You know, you have a deeper level of respect for the path you're walking. And often with either a core question in mind or some core way of honoring or way of appreciating what that tradition or what that uh, path means to you. But uh, Philip Cosano talked about what if we held our lives that way? And after that book, I wrote this poem called Sacred Relics. And I think it holds the theme for this section in many ways. I don't know when I lost my footing on the earth or when I moved upstairs from the heart to the lofty places where ideas dance. I don't know how many steps I must take to make the pilgrimage back to the Holy Land. But I do know the longing for something that cannot be named, the missing of something unknown, as if the day calls me, calls me out to play. Because I was once eager to go outside. I once knocked on the doors of friends uninvited. I once moved in my body as if I belonged there. But here I am now in the middle of my life with duties to be done and chores to be completed. When the pilgrim comes knocking on the door of my heart, bringing sacred relics of the life I have not yet lived, ready to take me even as I am if I am willing to make my way down the stairs and open myself to life once again. I sometimes like to, like to reverse that. When the pilgrim comes uninvited, knocking on the door of your heart, bringing sacred relics of the life you have not yet lived, ready to take you, even as you are, if you are willing to make your way down the stairs and open yourself to life once again. You know, to me, it's, it's a reminder that we don't know when that knock might occur on the door of our heart. You know, it could be right here in this time together right now. It could be something out in nature. You go out on a walk and you just see something and something in you, something in the moment turns or opens something inside of us. It could be a thought that comes. It could be an interaction with a person. To me, you don't know when the pilgrim's going to come knocking and reminding us that there is a deeper life we can live, that there is a grander presence we can bring to life. But that does also require making the journey down the stairs back to the heart. And so for me, that's what the theme of the unknown inner world is, is rather than living from the strategic mind, from the part of us that plans and plots and schemes and tries to make the world bend to our desire, to be open to living on a, a deeper level, just in relationship to life. You know, I, I think we, in many ways, because we have so much technology and so much ways of getting information in that we've lost the ability to read the signs in the world around us the signs in ourself and in our life that are really guiding us. We're, we've lost that tendency. We can just pull up our GPS and find the way. We can go on the internet and find answers to things. And, and that has, I think, in some ways disconnected us from finding the answers inside of us. So for me, the unknown inner world is stepping into that place where I'm invested in and nested in life and it's, carrying me it's bringing me somewhere and i want to participate in that in the course that life is carrying me beautiful yeah it's if, if it's one thing i've definitely learned from you nick is to expand my horizons i tend to be one of those people that like i like to have my act together you know so i have my plans and models and all kinds of good resources and things like that but you've definitely opened me more to that just the spontaneity and being open to whatever shows up and dancing with it and um, that it doesn't have to really be an either or approach, that it can be a blended approach that way. And so I appreciate that a lot. And that what's nice about the structure of this book is that it gives you offer a lot of resources to dive deeper into 
wh whether it's the message of the poem itself or the questions, the tasks and things that you've built in. Um, would you tell us a little bit more about, I mean, you touched a little bit on the difference between like a, the philosophical questions in the book versus the poetic questions. And uh, I think that's a really fascinating distinction if you'd share a little bit more about that. Yeah. I think the philosophical question engages the head. So if I ask, who am I? Um, a lot, the tendency might be to try to say, oh, you know, I have this name, I have this history, I have, you know, done these things, I have these qualities or traits I believe that are true of me. So I could answer it in that way. Um, but when I ask, you know, a question about the depth of roots in life and the, you know, the question of how much I trust life, that becomes a question I can't answer with the same kind of uh, prescripted kind of answers that might be available. I think I have to go into a different kind of place. I have to move from the head down to the heart to answer that. So I think that, you know, this section is really about the embodiment of our life rather than the framing of our life from our heads. Um, so for me, the poetic question, poetry really is the language of the soul. It speaks to the soul. So when I say, you know, where do you come from or what's your source? that question from a philosophical standpoint would tend to get me to answer, you know, more from the head. Whereas if I say, well, let's explore what your roots are in life. And if you were to go into those roots and feel the depth of them or feel what is the, what is that, that root nourishing inside of you, then that's a whole different exploration. Then it's more like an open ended exploration. I think that's a good distinction, but it offers more exploration on a soulful level. So for instance, like, the, the three tasks for that area are one is finding your roots. So first you have to know what your roots are and what different roots do, nourish you in different ways. So finding your roots is one of the, uh, the tasks there. And, uh, and roots can be in people, they can be in family, they can be in country, they can be in um, a kind of work that you do, they can be in a kind of study that you pursue. So I have deep roots in poetry, I have roots in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming and Hypnotherapy. All those are also roots. Um, what I'm going to do is share one of the poems from that section and just as an example of how our roots can, um, how we can explore our roots from the, you know, from a poem, a poem like introduces ideas or introduces thoughts or introduces possibilities and then it opens a door to explore. And the way the book is structured, there's a poem and then after that, there's questions to explore, writing prompts, you know, kind of things you can do with a poem. So the poem I'd like to share is called The Road Less Traveled. The Road Less Traveled. And it's kind of good. How many of you actually feel like you are walking a road less traveled in your life? And you can like raise your hand here or you could put your hand up in the chat, you know, in the uh, chat box or the participant box if you know how to do that. I think a lot of us actually feel like we're, we're the biggest tribe on the planet, I think, is the tribe called misfits. <laughs> the people who feel like they don't fit in in other, in other ways in life and other groups. And, and the road less traveled is partly about that. The road less traveled. If you take the road less traveled, don't be surprised if you travel alone. You might spot the bald eagle or see the mountain goat perched on the cliffside or find pools of pristine waters in remote lands, but your hermit heart still belongs to people. Ask the lonely ones who try so hard to find a way into life who feel lost amid a sea of strangers and who sleep in empty arms. Their sky may be filled with stars, but it will not save them from dark nights. And if they suffer too many, their bucket list loses all value. If you take the road less traveled, you will need an ally in the heart. So bring along a good book of poetry. And when you find a caravan of wandering troubadours or a little village where people still love silence, join them, at least for a while. Once you realize deep down that everyone is a misfit, you can find your tribe anywhere. So start with the person nearby and ask, to what or to whom does your heart belong? Once you realize deep down 
that everyone is a misfit, you can find your tribe anywhere. Start with a person nearby and ask, to what or to whom does your heart belong? Now, I like to think there are, there are powerful questions, which are questions that can really help us move forward in our lives. And then there are beautiful questions, and beautiful questions deepen us. So powerful questions tend to move us forward towards action or to make possibilities happen, whereas beautiful questions, I think, deepen us. And I think that's a really beautiful question to hold when you meet somebody, even a stranger, to, to what or to whom does your heart belong? So that's the poem. And then the book goes on to talk a little bit about that, that, kind of, that poem and what I, what I think of it as and what it means. And then it has questions. Um, so one question is, to, you know, to whom does your heart belong? Make a list of groups of, and people outside of your family, because in this section on finding roots, there is a whole part of it devoted to finding family, the poem going before this, this one. Um, but think of uh, people are outside of your family with whom you have roots, and rate how deeply you are rooted in each one. Ro which roots do you want to deepen or loosen? So there may be some groups you want to deepen your connection with. For me, since I have spent many of the past 20 years on the road traveling and not that, and not home much, I've not had a local community. So I haven't had deep roots in my local community, my local environment. Part of the blessing of COVID is that it's given me this opportunity to do something I've long wanted to do, which is to um, deepen my roots here in the local community, to meet people like, like Lynn and like a Diane that are part of the poetry community and really start to make friends and connections here. So that's an example of consciously making that effort to deepen roots in one area. And so the book gives opportunities to explore those kinds of questions and discover where they might lead you. Very nice. Yeah, it's, um, I really love that, Nick, that um, I, as I've been exploring, you know, my own roots and deepening and uh, uh, I just love that you give so many resources for going deeper. And one of them you touch on in the book is, um, uh, instinct versus into instinct and intuition developing as a path. Just a, I noticed somebody is making some background noise there. If whoever's doing that, if you could mute yourself, there's a lot of kind of clicking and clacking going on, at least in the background of my computer. So I'd appreciate that. Yeah. So Larry, it, 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 as you're asking here about the second of the three tasks associated with uh, this whole unknown inner world. Um, first one is finding your roots. The second one is developing your instincts and intuition in life. And for me, this is um, about developing that trust and that ability to use our own, you could say, natural wisdom and refine our natural wisdom by our interactions with life. And uh, I'm not necessarily an advocate that our intuition or our instincts are always right. I think our intuition and our instincts are something we develop actually. And one way we can develop instinct and intuition is by noticing what you intuit will happen or what your instinct says to do. Noticing it first, and then if you act on it, noticing what happens and how often does the world actually fulfill your intuition or not, if you're honest with yourself. If you're honest with yourself, if you're off, that's not a sign that you don't have intuition or that your intuition is bad. That's a sign that you're learning. Same thing with memory. You know, one way to improve your memory is remember something. So say you read something, think of something from the book, summarize it in your own way, think of something, or even quiz yourself about the book and notice whether you remember or not. If you do remember, if you come up with the idea, go back and verify that it's correct. If you remember something and you go by it back and verify that it's incorrect, that's not a sign you have a poor memory. That's a sign that, you're, you're, uh, um, that you need to maybe take another step or you need to change your strategy in order to integrate something. And I think intuition and instinct is, is the same way. We have an idea that we notice what happens and we verify whether what we intuited actually would happen or not. When it does, celebrate it, acknowledge it. When it doesn't, you might be curious about what did you miss? What could you have noticed that might have clued you in to what would happen? That's how you develop intuition and instinct. 
So for me, an example of that is um, in the section of the book there on developing instinct is the poem Blanket of Quiet. So I'd like to share that poem now, Blanket of Quiet. Sometimes the soul asks a question we cannot answer except by being quiet. And we do not know if it will take a day, a week, a year, because the question itself is often hidden from us. Sometimes the soul asks a question we cannot answer except by being quiet. And we do not know if it will take a day, a week, a year, because the question itself is often hidden from us. But it calls us to nature, to solitude, to the quiet where we know all answers are our own. Then one day, wrapped in that blanket of quiet, like a cocoon, we emerge. And we say to each other, I love what you love, without losing ourselves. This is what the Buddha meant when he spoke of compassion. And a lot of times I think the soul, the spirit inside of us is working on something. It's evolving us into the next iteration of ourselves, but we aren't aware of it consciously. We're going about our daily lives. We're doing our daily things. We're struggling with the things we struggle with, and we don't realize that on a deeper level, a transformation is happening. Something magical is unfolding. It may be a small shift, and it may be a big shift in life, but it's happening under the surface, and yet we get hints of it, or we get little um, noticings that something might be changing, and if we can be attentive to that, we might begin to ask, well, I wonder what the question is that's being asked on that soul level, what it's searching for, what it's seeking. And to me, that's when we start to refine our intuition, when we don't jump too quickly to knowing, and we can't give ourselves permission to be in that unknowing space. Sometimes the soul asks a question we cannot answer except by being quiet. And we do not know if it will take a day, a week, a year, because the question itself is often hidden from us. But it calls us to nature, to solitude, to the quiet where we know all answers are our own. Then one day, wrapped in that blanket of quiet like a cocoon, we emerge and we say to each other, I love what you love, without losing ourselves. This is what the Buddha meant when he spoke of compassion. And to me, you know, sometimes when I'm writing a poem, I don't know where a line comes from. Like I got to that point in the poem, the cocoon, we emerge and we say to each other, and I'll often do this in my writing, I'll have a line like that, and we say to each other, and I have no idea what's gonna come after that. And I love hanging myself on that cliff edge and wondering what's going to come, what is the line that's gonna come that I've just set myself up to receive? And I try not to answer it consciously, I try to let it come, and that's when I got, I love what you love. And we say to each other, I love what you love. To be in that place where you can, you can really hold another person's desire or wish in the world without denying it and without having it deny yours. And I think that's what's needed in our world now, is if we could hold the wish the dream of other people in, in our hearts and love that, love the essence of that, which I believe is always going to have a kind of a essential good quality behind it without losing our own, then I think we're making real progress. Beautiful. You know, Nick, it reminds me of uh, um, one of our, uh, maybe a year or so ago, one of our creative collaboration calls and we were, uh, exploring the different inputs, you know, like we have our inspiration that come, maybe comes for many people from spirit, or there's our, of course, our intellect, there's input that comes from the five senses. We have our intuition, our instinct. Um, there's, of course, emotion. Um, so there, there's all these inputs of information and to be able to pay attention to them and be able to sort them and, you know, what are the messages there for us? Uh, I, I think uh, Eckhart Tolle had the metaphor of like a, a cat waiting outside a mouse hole, waiting for the mouse to appear. And sometimes I, I think of, uh, it's, it's like that, paying attention to the inputs, like what's going to show up next, <laughs> you know, and then how do I dance with it? 
Yeah. And I love your, you know, the, uh, the last section in here about, or the task of intimacy with life. You know, to be able to then take that and then how do we have a more intimate engagement with life? And so could you speak a little bit more about that last task? Yeah, you know, the, the whole idea of the unknown inner world that we're interacting with something greater than ourselves and this amazing thing called life, this incredible gift called life. So for me, the deepening of our roots is about being able to connect with life in as many ways as possible. Um, and, uh, and having a sense of having, you could say, intimacy with life so that I feel close to life. In fact, I have one, one of my um, practices is I get up every morning and I do a visioning process and I have six areas of life. And uh, um, in, in uh, one of those areas, um, I have this phrase that goes, I love life and life loves me. I love life and life loves me. And, and so I'll, I'll repeat that kind of idea. I love life and life loves me. And that feeling of just having, having a kind of intimacy with the world. You know, the leaves can talk to you, the rocks can talk to you. I, recently, about two weeks, well, I guess about 10 days ago, I got interested in the life of St. Francis. And uh, there's a course from the, the Great Courses, which is an online university, basically, that was on uh, St. Francis. It was 12 lectures. So I got that. And then I, I started exploring other things, like there's a, uh, um, an Amazon Prime video called When Rumi Met Francis, because they were contemporaries. They lived about the same time, early 1200s. Uh, Rumi was born around 1207. And... Uh, uh, St. Francis was born in 1181, uh, 82, they don't, not sure which, and died in, 11, in 1226. So they had some overlap. And this uh, Muslim man who's a mu musician was wondering what it would have been like if the two of them had met. And his main concern was what happens when these two faiths, the Muslim faith and the Christian faith, what happens if they were to come together represented in the spirit of these two figures, Rumi and St. Francis? Um, so this whole, you know, the whole idea of St. Francis became very compelling to me recently. And, um, and what I think is beautiful about St. Francis is his intimacy with life. That's what is uh, one of the high, uh, highlighting characteristics of him. You know, he, he could talk to animals, animals talk to him. He could go out and, you know, everything was brother and sister, brother sun, sister moon, brother rock, sister flower. Everything had this quality of kinship. And to me, I think that's what intimacy with life is, is that intimacy is life, with life is that quality of kinship with life. It's like, I belong here. This is my place of belonging. These are my brothers and sisters. This is my place. And I think that's one of the big issues in our modern world is where do we belong? And where do we get that feeling of belonging? One of the poems that I wrote for that, for that section is called, I Woke Up a Different Man. I Woke Up a Different Man. I want to share that one with you. I woke up this morning a different man. I didn't know it when I first opened my eyes and threw the covers off of my life. Or when I lifted myself out of dreams and my feet hit the cool surface of solid ground. It all seemed so casual, so matter of fact, as if I had always known it would be so, and it required no notice from me. I walked out the door with my stained grace and broken dignity, clear-eyed and curious about what lay ahead of me. Everything shimmered alive, and I fell into step with my heart. I had no need of plan or purpose, no destiny to follow, no desire to fulfill, no fire to put out, and no litter to pick up. I felt nothing for the first time since before I could remember nothing at all between me and the world. So I think intimacy is that feeling when there's nothing between you and another person. There's nothing between you and an experience, this raw, beautiful experience that you might be having in life. There's nothing between you and the tree that you're sitting under. There's nothing between you and the water that's flowing by. That kind of experience has been written about in every spiritual tradition. And to me, that's one of the goals is to, in my personal life, is to have that feeling, open myself to having that feeling as often as possible. 
I, mean, I, I love the lines again, you know, when I'm writing poetry, sometimes I'm not consciously crafting the lines. You know, I like this idea of, I woke up this morning a different man. It's like, we, we, when you have that feeling of something shifted inside of you, but you don't quite know what it is. You know, and I, I used to have this experience many times when I was young, I would wake up in the morning and I would have this very vivid, palpable sense that something really important happened. And I would rack my memory going back over the days and what is it that's important that happened that I'm just not able to get my, 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 put my finger on or wrap my mind around, but it was so palpable. And then one day I realized probably I had dreamed something. And in that other life called dreaming, something really important had happened but I couldn't remember it because it was stored in that other life, that, that other world that you can only enter when you go into a different state, a significantly different state. And so for me, the poem invites the possibility that there could be a magical transformation happening inside of your life right now, of which you might only get little hints or little uh, notices along the way. And if you're paying attention, if you're willing to open yourself to it, you might just be able to ride that current into a future that's elegant and beautiful and beyond what you might conceive in your conscious mind. And I know we're, we're coming here, we're about 45 minutes into it here. Um, and so I thought maybe, Larry, if, it, if it's, unless you have another question to ask that we can maybe go on to question and answer. If anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask, and I'll do my best to answer them. Hi, Nick, Don. Hi, Don. Good Hi. to see you. <laughs> Good to be seen. So I'm wondering if there's a particular time or energy that you feel in a given day or a given month. Do you have peaks and lulls that you recognize? Yeah, I definitely have peaks and lulls. You know, there's like on a larger scale in life, like say with writing, um, there's times when I'm prolific and I write a lot. And then there are times when the flow seems to dim down. I keep writing anyway. My, my, my goal is to write something every single day. And I do typically write a poem a day. If I miss it, I, I make up for it because on average, I write about 1.5 poems a day. <laughs> so I'll make up for it sooner or later. But yeah, so, and, I, and I, I've learned over time that when the, the flow is thinner or when it's less or seems to stop, that that's not a sign I've lost it or that the muse has abandoned me. <laughs> it's really a sign that there's something else that needs to happen. There's a kind of consolidation. So that's often when I start to put, pull together poems for a book, or I start to you know, go back maybe and look at some old things that I've done and, and rework them. And I think that same kind of rhythmicity is true in a lot of other things in life. So for me, I tend to be more of a morning person. I get up and I'm most productive in the morning. So that's when I know that my energy is best spent on things I need to focus my mind on. Whereas later in the day in the afternoon, that's when it's better to do the diffuse kind of thinking. They found, by the way, from research that the way to learn is by doing a combination of focused learning and diffuse learning. So focused learning is when you really, you're, you're putting your energy and effort concentrating to learn something. And diffuse is when you go off and do something else and you're not even thinking about it. You know, that's when your mind is, coordinating, you know, integrating, doing things on the inside. And so they actually recommend by, I guess from research, 25 minutes of focus time and five to 10 minutes of diffuse time is a good combination when you're studying something. So yeah, Don, I think there's all kinds of these kind of rhythm, rhythms that you can feel in yourself. We tend, I think we tend to in our modern world, disavow the body and disavow, we don't have to pay attention to night and day rhythms because we can keep lights on all night. You know, we don't have to pay attention to the rhythm of the seasons because we can cloister ourselves inside and don't have to worry about whether it's winter outside or not. So I think we've disconnected from so many rhythms that we've lost connection with those little subtle rhythms that, that tell us and teach us how to live better and how to live more close to ourselves and close to life. Yeah, I agree. And I think, as you said earlier, the corona has allowed a lot of people to get an opportunity to experience things that everyday life challenges and opportunities tend to make us void of, of being who we are. Yeah, yeah, great question. 
I think like a lot of this section of the book, a lot of this practice is really about learning to catch those things in ourselves and read ourselves better, so to speak. I, you know, I used to tell people, I'm a, I'm a reverse clairvoyant. I, I can't read other people's minds. I, I read my own mind. The problem is I, a lot of times I get it wrong. <laughs> and I think it's true that a lot of times we think we know ourselves and we don't really. There's a deeper thought underneath the, you know, the thoughts that are here cluttering our conscious mind. And sometimes that distraction is necessary for the seeds to take root under the surface and grow through the, you know, through the soil to sprout in our lives in a conscious way. Yeah, th a great question. Thanks for it. Other questions? Um, my question for you, Nick, and you know, I've enjoyed getting to know you and have marveled at how positive you stay and how forward thinking you are. And I wonder if that ever intrudes upon your editing process and also, do you ever go back to those dark places? Do you spend time there as well? Yeah, you know, I, I, I have a, um, a tendency towards the positive and I want to live on that side of the street, so to speak. But I'm also very, very aware that a lot of the, you know, the, I've had my dark nights of the soul. So the example of dark night of the soul for me is when I start to question whether, whether poetry is something I should be doing at all in life. You know, what, what's, the, what's the point, you know, what the hell? It doesn't, I don't get any money from it. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's much supported in the world. <laughs> and I'll go into these spaces or I'll go into these places where I really question myself and what I'm, what I'm about in life. And, um, and when I go there, I try to not, not jump out of it too quickly. I want to stay in that space. I think a lot of creative stuff comes out of that. You know, a lot of incredible poetry comes out of that, that darker place. And, um, but yeah, my tendency is to want to go, you know, I want to move away from it. So I think that there is a risk the, that you're presenting. And that is that since I want a poem to end positively, am I then pushing the poem away from where the poem wants to go? Like, uh, you know, Ellen Bass was talking about the other night on her. She talked about she, you know, where the poem wanted to go. And, um, and I, do, I do try to put myself in the position where I get, you know, I, I literally hang myself on the cliff, as I was talking about earlier. I come up with a line and I do not know what's going to come next out of that. And I know I've got a good line when it's not one that I would have consciously thought of, you know. Um, yeah, and so like this poem, Woke Up a Different Man, actually it was longer and I did edit some pieces out of it. And the pieces I edited out were something about the struggles of being in that position of, you know, you, you have something changing inside of you, but you aren't aware of it and how that can create incongruence or conflict in your life. But when I, I, I shared that, I was in a writing group that. at the time and they, they suggested I cut that stuff out. And actually I think it becomes a better poem because of it but in that particular case. There's others where I think that's not true. We're having that, that uh, negative part, you know, the kind of quote, the negative part um, is, is, is what makes the poem transformative. Yeah. Um, like, here's an example. I'll share a poem with you called Never Give Up. Um, it's also in the book. I refuse to join the masses who live a hard labor life rather than be an easy target and who tunnel out of the prison of mediocrity with a spoon rather than stand naked in the light. I have had enough of darkened eyes, stalking the light on moonless night when the clouds hide my destiny. Enough of the rudderless life drifting in the wind, hoping I might one day hear the voice of God. Enough mining glory from the trivia of my days and seeking answers in a book of dog-eared pages to questions I've long forgotten but I won't be shedding tears because I will never give up on the power of an acorn to produce an oak or the drive of the salmon leaping against the odds to return to its source. So I think, you know, that like being willing to be in that struggle, being willing to, you know, the tides against you and you're going to, you know, come hell or high water, you're going to get back to your source. Even if it means going through the darkest of dark nights, even if it means facing the worst in yourself, even if it means confronting somebody in a relationship because your boundaries have been broken and it might end the relationship. To me, that's the kind of place where poetry becomes a source 
of courage and strength for us. And a, our willingness to be in that dark space, I think, is critical. So. I got a question for you, Nick. Uh, you are familiar with all these critics, editors, students, and people, uh, I call it colleagues that are sitting here today. Uh, how do you balance the use of uh, these uh, colleagues, critics, editors, and students? You mean like input from other people? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I love feedback on my poetry, but I'm also very internally referenced. So what that means is, People can give me all kinds of suggestions and I may not do any of them because I feel like it's what it needs to be. Um, whereas sometimes, like with this group that I did, uh, that I was sharing the um, uh, I Woke Up a Different Man poem and they gave me feedback and I did play around with it. And then I read the poem in two different forms to different people and the response to the shortened version of the poem was much stronger than the response to the longer version. So sometimes I, I'll use that feedback because I think there's something in the collective, uh, collective wisdom that's maybe wiser than my conscious mind is about it. Um, and then there are other times when I'll, I'll still feel like no matter what they say, I'm gonna keep it the way it is. So, um, and you know, when I, I mentioned when I was early on, I was sensitive. So if people said something was not good, I would like retreat into my hole and lick my wounds for a week. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm a lot more thick skinned. <laughs> and actually, I, I value that kind of feedback. It is risky sometimes, I think, when we're writing poetry or doing artwork that's more personal to have feedback on it because it feels like it's yeah. almost like it's about us. But I've gotten to the point, I think, where I feel like my art is not me, it's beyond me. I, I get to go along for the ride. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Well, it looks like we're coming close to the end of our time here together. So uh, I wanted to say thank you very much for all of you for attending and for joining in. And uh, please, if you haven't, I'd love it if you buy a copy of the book. It's available on amazon.com. Uh, and uh, um, I'll be doing two more of these in the next two weeks. And I'm actually thinking about, I'm, I'm projecting ahead. There's another book that I wrote that's like this one that's called The Work of Being Yourself. And I might do a round on that one because it's also a workbook as well as poems after this one. So I'm kind of casting into the future a possibility here. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Larry, thank you so much for your friendship and for your support of my work and uh, for the great questions that you ask and for uh, your presence in my life. I appreciate it, man. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank great. you. Yes, thank you, Nana. Thank you so much, Nick. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So may you have a great Sunday, and I will see you next week. And those of you who haven't, if you want to join in on my read around, um, which is uh, I send out a, po po a prompt on Mondays, and you have a chance to write about them, just uh, email me, and I can add you to the list if you're not on it. My email is my name, Nick LaForce at me.com. I'll put it over here in the chat. So if you want to email me, you can do it there. That's Nick LaForce at me.com. I spelled it wrong. So there it is. So feel free to email me. And uh, if you would like to be on my email list, you can go to my website, which is my name, www.nicklaforce.com. And you can sign up for the mailing list and then I'll keep you posted. I send out, I mean, at most one email a week and sometimes I only send out one a month. So <laughs> won't be overwhelmed. <laughs> anyway, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings thank to you, you all and I will thank see you. you in the future. Hopefully. Thank you. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.